Well, good morning, City Light. Oh, as Doug said, I have the honor of serving as one of the elders here at, at our church. I'm also a co-leader of one of our city groups. Today, however, I am known as the everyone is on vacation mode, so let's get Dave to preach guy. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thankful and glad that our, our pastors can have some time off to get away from a renewal, refreshment with their families, and this gives me the opportunity then to dig into scripture with all of you today. I want to start today with a, a tragic story, and I know this is shifting gears a little bit, but soon we'll see why. It was back on Friday, April 12th of 2019, that Emmanuel Aranda walked into the Mall of America, and in his own words, he was looking for someone to kill. Aranda walked up to a mom and her five-year-old son. He grabbed the child and threw him off a balcony 40 feet above the floor. The boy, Landon Hanneman, uh, surprisingly, was not killed instantly with the, with the impact. However, he was left with some life-threatening injuries, including multiple broken bones and severe head trauma. Now, if that was you, how would you respond? If, if that was your five-year-old lying on the ground 40 feet below, how would you feel towards your attacker? That crime, so heinous and so disturbing, so deliberate, it'd be hard to erase from your mind. Now, as a parent, would forgiveness even cross your mind? Is forgiveness even an option? Now, let, let's be honest. The, the churchy answer of we should forgive everybody probably isn't the first thing that popped into your mind if that was you. Now, you might be thinking, lethal injection? That's too good for Aranda. Electric chair? Maybe. The handgun in my nightstand? Possibly. But forgiveness? Not an option. If your son landed on the floor 40 feet below, where would you land on the forgiveness scale? You know, there's nothing easy about the forgiveness that Jesus calls us to. Jesus, as our uncommon king, calls us and invites us to be a part of his uncommon kingdom, which he refers to as the kingdom of heaven. And life in his kingdom is characterized by uncommon forgiveness. In our text this morning that, that Doug read, uh, we'll see that this uncommon forgiveness is presented two different ways. First of all, it's forgiveness received, which is God's heart towards us, but second of all, it's also forgiveness given, which is our heart towards other people. Now, in the verses um, just prior to our text today that lead up to it, Jesus is discussing with his disciples how to handle a situation where one Christian sins against another. And in verses 15 through 20 of Matthew 18, he gives us a biblical pattern of how to seek rec reconciliation within the church. And he says it starts with one-on-one -on -one conversations. You go talk to the person about it, and if reconciliation is found, great. If not, take two or three people with you and try again. Pursue reconciliation again. But if that doesn't work, Jesus says bring the matter before the church and talk it through, with reconciliation always being the goal. Jesus shows us this progression of how to handle sin issues between believers a good practice for us to follow. Well, that discussion and that teaching leads one of his disciples named Peter to follow up with that with, with a question, what seems to be a very normal question, one that all of us would ask. Because in verse 21 of Matthew 18, Peter says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? I mean, the question is, how many times should I forgive somebody? How much forgiveness is too much? Where, where do we draw the line in the sand and say, my forgiveness tank has run dry? So Peter asked, should I forgive seven times? Now, think about that for a minute. A fellow believer has hurt you and sinned against you. And Peter, thinking he is going to the extreme, asked if, if he should go so far as to forgive that person, not once, not twice, not three times, but seven times. Now, the rabbinical teaching of the day taught that three times was the limit. 
three times with, with the, the extent of, of uh, showing forgiveness. So a person that would do that, would forgive three times, represented a forgiving person in that day. You know, today we would call that three strikes and you're out. Maybe for you, you're thinking that's three strikes too many. So Peter went so far as to suggest seven times. And that was a whole lot more than just a little stretch. See, in in the Bible, the, the number seven represents something complete, something whole. So when Peter said seven times, he was saying, this probably represents uh, the fullness of forgiveness. If I would forgive the same person for sinning against me seven times. Well, Jesus' reply to that is is challenging. Not only for the disciples, but but for us today. Because Jesus says that life in the kingdom does away with all limits and calculations of forgiveness. So Jesus responds and says, not seven times, but 77 times. And other Bible translations say 70 times seven, or 490 times. This was Jesus' way of saying that there is no limit. You don't keep score. This uncommon kingdom that we are a part of is characterized by uncommon forgiveness. And some might say it's unrealistic forgiveness. And that's where this parable comes in. Jesus tells this parable as a way to illustrate with some life examples of what uncommon forgiveness looks like. And Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, uses the theme of of money, something close to our hearts, to communicate in such a way as to get not only the disciples' attention, but ours as well. And as the parable goes, a king is settling his accounts, and this is something that you know, would be expected, ordinary work, nothing unusual there. But one of the servants called before him owes this crazy amount of money of 10,000 talents. Now, in the Greek mathematical system of of that day, 10,000 was the highest possible number that they would, could count. It was really an arbitrary number, just something to represent that which was beyond reach and beyond comprehension. The equivalent today might be to say $1 trillion dollars. You know, a trillion is a number that most of us, including myself, can't wrap our brain around. Because it's a one with 12 zeros behind it. It's 10 to the 12th power. It's 1 million million. I mean, just it's mind-blowing to think about that. Well, so it is with 10,000 talents. For, for the disciples to hear Jesus talking about a servant that owed that much money it would have been unimaginable. So using that outrageous number, Jesus begins to set the stage for what happens next. So the king says, you owe me 10,000 talents. And the servant responds by saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Really? This guy actually thinks that he can get his way out of that debt? He's probably thinking to himself, you know, a trillion bucks, it's not that bad. I'll get a second part-time job, have it paid off in no time. A little side hustle here, a little hustle there. I'll do the Dave Ramsey thing and voila, debt-free, you know? See, his comment and his response to the king just uh, reveals that he had no concept of how big a debt he owes. He does not know how mistaken he was to think that he could actually work his way back into favor with the king. So there's, there's this great debt to pay on the one hand, yet something even greater is about to take place in this parable. Because the parable takes this unexpected and unprecedented turn. Because in verse 27, it says, And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. What? I mean, just wipe that debt from the books? What what kind of king would do that? What was that king thinking? That's not good business. That's ridiculous. That that king had every legal right to require payment and every right to require that his family and possessions be sold to make payment. But instead, he forgives. The servant's life is spared. The family is spared. His debt is forgiven. The servant 
all of a sudden finds himself with this unexpected windfall of good fortune. Well, then the parable takes another unexpected turn. Because the servant who just received forgiveness and mercy goes out and finds a fellow servant who owes him a much more tangible and payable amount of 100 denarii. And this is the equivalent of about three months of wages. It's not an insignificant amount, but something much more tangible that could realistically be repaid. So the first servant finds him, grabs him, puts him in a chokehold, and says, and demands payment, repayment. So just what just went down between those two servants quickly makes its way back to the king. And the king calls that first servant back before him, and he, and he says, should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay back all his debt. Wow. Then, then comes words from Jesus that take this parable out of the realm of just being a wild story and an outrageous debt and a ruthless servant, takes us out of that realm and into our lives, into yours and mine. Because he concludes this parable by bringing it back to each one of us, whether we are in financial debt or not. And Jesus says this in verse 35, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. You know what? There are days when I wish that verse wasn't in the Bible. You know what I mean? There are days when I find myself mad at my own brother, my own flesh and blood for saying and doing stupid and hurtful stuff. And that leaves me mad and ticked off and upset, and there's no way I want to forgive him, but wouldn't you know it? Jesus said it. And that verse remains right where it's at. And there are days when people have said hurtful things to me and they've verbally attacked and I want to do a verbal counterattack, but wouldn't you know it, that verse remains. And there are days when every ounce of my flesh doesn't want to forgive, but I read that verse and I'm reminded of how much Jesus has forgiven me. That's why this is uncommon forgiveness. It's, it's unexpected, and from a worldly, fleshly standpoint, it's unrealistic. But that's how life in the kingdom rolls. So this parable brings home two points for us today. The first, it, it gives us this beautiful picture of God's heart towards us, the forgiveness that we receive. And, and second of all, and even more difficult, it's a call to action. A call to action for us to examine our own hearts towards others and the forgiveness that we give out. Now, when you look at the life of Jesus and you read his interactions with the disciples in, in the Gospels, we see that these disciples never really understood what kind of king Jesus was. Jesus was constantly teaching about the kingdom of heaven about who he was, about what he was there to do, but they just could not grasp it, especially when it came to Jesus predicting his death, crucifixion, and resurrection. Their, their misunderstanding often revolved around questions like, why would our returning king do that? Well, why would a king have to die? You know, kings don't do that kind of thing. But Jesus willingly stepped into the punishment, into the pain, and death of the cross for one reason. To pay an insurmountable and outrageous debt that we all owed. A debt that's so large it's, it's impossible for us to work our way out of it, no matter how hard you try, how diligent you are, how many extra part-time jobs you take on. Because it is the debt of sin. Sin that is so real, so painful to the Father, so heinous in His sight, that He demanded a payment be made. And that this was done not in some type of installment plan over the centuries, but it was, it was a one-time, one-and-done payment in the form of His one and only Son, Jesus. And the method of payment was death. And that meant Jesus going to the cross to die in our place, for our sins, so that our debt could be forgiven. 
And when he did that, it opens the door for us to be restored into a right relationship with God. The relationship that he has desired since the Garden of Eden. You see, our debt has been forgiven. Past tense. The work has been done in the past. And the forgiveness that that God brings to us comes through pain. Pain of the father watching his son take on the burden of sin, the death of sin, as he hung on the cross. And it's the pain of Jesus going through the torture of flogging and crucifixion and death. Yet on the other side of his sacrificial death comes life. See, Jesus defeated the grave in his resurrection. Jesus wiped out the debt of our sin in his triumph over the grave. So through that lens of who Jesus is, of of what he has done for us, of what his kingdom means, we can look at this parable today and truly say, that's how much the Father has forgiven me. We all have this massive debt, impossible to, to pay, this debt called sin. So Jesus assumed that debt for us and canceled the debt. See, that's God's heart towards us. If that's forgiveness received, what about our heart towards other people? What about the forgiveness that God calls us to give? Because remember, there's that last line in this parable, that last verse, which moves it from the realm of parable and all of a sudden makes it very personal. It comes off the page of the Bible and hits us hard right between the eyes. You see, this goes from a tale about someone else's debt to a tale of our own, of my own. This becomes our story, my story, and it's a story that we can all intentionally write. We write it through our actions, through our heart, towards other people. See, this is a parable not only about God's forgiving us, but it's also about our heart and forgiveness towards others. Now, there will be times where the forgiveness that God calls us to do will require that we have to press through the pain and hurt that surrounds us, no matter how deep. Those are the seasons where we need to let go of the pain caused by others and just simply hang on to the promise that only Jesus gives. So what what does that look like? First and foremost, it begins by acknowledging that God is God and you're not. And by that, I simply mean he is the one in control. He is the ultimate judge. He is the one who will hold all of us accountable for our actions and our attitude. He is also the one who's willing to show mercy to all who repent and turn to him, no matter how evil their past. Now, that might not sit... Well, with us, but that's what kind of king we have. That's what what kind of kingdom we are a part of. Now think about how God has used different people in the Bible. He used a murderer, a guy named Moses, to to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, and led them in the wilderness for 40 years. He used a guy named Paul to start uh, New Testament churches all around uh, the area the same man who previously was judge and executioner of early Christians. And later on in history, uh, God used a man named John Newton. John Newton had made his living as a slave trader and later in life uh, encountered Jesus, went through a conversion, and he wrote this little hymn called Amazing Grace, a hymn that we still sing and still impacts people today. I think about how God has used me, despite my sordid past and my mistakes and the sins that have once controlled me. And I've been forgiven a lot, and I'm reminded of that continually, and God has called me to extend forgiveness to others. Think about your past. Think about your B.C. days, your before Christ days, and where you are at today, and the people that you need to extend forgiveness to. Because hanging on to anger and hatred only leads to a bitter and hardened heart. See, knowing that God is God and God is in control allows us to forgive. And then we find that forgiveness is really freeing. 
It's liberating and allows us to move past the pain and into healing. After Aranda threw Landon from the balcony, Landon was left with multiple broken bones, facial and skull fractures, and fluid filling his heart, his lungs, and stomach. He went on to have more than 15 different medical procedures and surgeries. And in August of 2019, Landon came home from the hospital. He came home with a limp because of uneven legs from a broken femur and an open wound in his stomach. But he has continually uh, grown strong and, and has healed up to this day. And when his mother kept asking him how, how he's doing, he finally told her and said, Mom, I'm healed. You don't need to ask me anymore. As his mom put it, Landon loves life and loves Jesus. He tells people all the time when they get hurt, don't worry, I fell off a cliff, but angels caught me. And Jesus loves me, so I'm okay, and you will be too. In her victim impact statement, she told Aranda that she had forgiven him because of her faith in God. And I think her words describe a right relationship of what forgiveness is. Here's what she wrote. God will judge you someday, and I have peace with that. I hand it off to him, and you will take none of my thoughts ever again. And Landon's father wrote, You chose to take your hurt and your hate out on my precious boy. That is where your impact on us stops. I believe that's a picture of forgiveness. Giving your pain over to the one who's in control, the one who created you, and the one who formed you. And you don't hang on to it to let it consume you. So this life that we live by faith, this life that we live in the kingdom of God, it's characterized by uncommon forgiveness. Forgiveness both received and forgiveness given. So today I want to challenge you to, to step into that. Step into the kingdom of heaven that Jesus uh, lays before us. Step into it and receive the forgiveness of the Father but also step into the uncommon forgiveness that he calls us to give others. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for, for Jesus, for him doing the work on the cross to take on the debt of sin and to wipe it clean. Father, I thank you that's been done in the past. It's, 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 uh, it's already been taken care of, and you have opened up to us a relationship with the Father. So, Father, may we step into that relationship. May we step into the kingdom of heaven that you have instituted. And as we do, Lord, we receive your forgiveness. But, Lord, also just empower us to forgive others as well. And we ask this and pray this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.